Now, to be honest, it's not often we talk about Australian politics in the 1970s, but we're going to do so now and with good reason. Back in 1975, the then Prime Minister, Gough Whitlam, was sacked and replaced by the opposition. It was a huge controversy because the decision to sack him was taken by the Governor-General, the Governor-General being Queen Elizabeth's representative in Australia. He argued he had the authority to do this under implied powers in the Constitution. The reason I'm talking about this today is that these newly released letters from the National Archives of Australia show the Queen wasn't informed in advance. There are hundreds of them between the Governor-General, Sir John Kerr, and Buckingham Palace. John Kerr wrote to the Queen's private secretary on the day he dismissed the Prime Minister that he was of the opinion it was better for Her Majesty not to know in advance, but that, of course, his duty was to tell her immediately. The palace replied he had acted not only with constitutional propriety, but also with admirable consideration for Her Majesty's position. Of course, not all Australians were quite so glowing about it. But the justification for the sacking was that Gough Whitlam had failed to get parliamentary approval for his spending plans and was refusing to call an election. Whitlam famously said this at the time of his dismissal. Well, may we say, God save the Queen. Because nothing will save the Governor-General. Well, let's speak to Matthew Doran, political reporter for ABC News in Australia. He's live with me in, in Canberra. Um, Matthew, is it overstating things to say this, this moment in 1975 helped shape modern Australian politics? I think it's certainly right to say that, Ross. Uh, that uh, declaration from Gough Whitlam on the steps of Old Parliament House is etched into the Australian psyche as one of the most uh, most important parts of Australian history there. There's long been this discussion about what role Buckingham Palace had in the sacking of Gough Whitlam, given that the crisis, the constitutional crisis leading up to his dismissal had carried on for well, really a number of months. It really started to gather uh, ahead of its own uh, towards that dismissal, but it had been dragging on uh, for for, uh, for about a year or so ahead of that. So there had been all this discussion about how Gough Whitlam's government would be able to continue on, what options were available to the Governor-General, Sir John Kerr, at the time. And these letters that were released yesterday by the National Archives, you mentioned hundreds, there's actually thousands, there's mm -hmm. 1,200 pages of correspondence between Government House here in Canberra and Buckingham Palace in London. It shows that while uh, Sir John Kerr didn't tell the Queen, or at least her staff, ahead of time that he was uh, sacking Gough Whitlam as Prime Minister, it does show that they were talking about the issue for months and months beforehand. And Martin Charteris, the then private secretary to Queen Elizabeth, was advising him that he had these powers under the constitution, that it wasn't up to Buckingham Palace to make the call, but those powers to effectively pull the trigger and sign Gough Whitlam's political death warrant were within his remit as uh, the Queen's representative here in Canberra. And what's the impact been? Has it brought it all back? Well, I think there was a lot of interest about these letters yesterday from the political and legal nerd sort of circles, if I can describe them that way. But certainly uh, this is something that has been a key moment of Australian history. A lot of people wondering, OK, do we really care now? It was 45 years ago. Can we move on? But others suggesting that it's potentially going to spark a new debate about a Republican movement here in Australia. Should there be any role for uh, Buckingham Palace to be advising a Governor General on anything or should it effectively just be uh, somewhere that can receive correspondence from the Antipodes and sort of leave it at that. Uh, did Martin Charter sort of overstep the mark there? So I think that's going to be the, the impact of what we saw uh, yesterday with these letters being uh, released. But there's 1,200 odd pages and I think people are still uh, pouring over them as we speak. And is the, is the issue of the relationship between Australia and the British royal family still live or is it slightly waned as a, as a potent political issue? It always comes up now and again. The last time that Australia voted to become a republic back in 1999, that uh, referendum was defeated. There is a dual trigger in Australia. Not only do you have to get a majority of the population, you have to get a majority of the states and territories also voting in favour, and it fell short there. But it has been brought up again, and it uh, seems to wax and wane depending on the fortunes of the royal family as well. There is always this overriding sense in Australia of if it isn't broken, don't bother fixing it. But uh, at the moment, I think with the many other things on the minds of, of Australians, coronavirus and the like, uh, chiefly among them, it's probably not something that's going to appear anytime soon. But it is always lingering there at the, the back of the mind. Do we still need to have a foreign head of state? And if we don't, 
what model should it take uh, here in Australia? That is a, a, another and arguably a more uh, pressing and, uh, and wholesome debate that always happens when uh, this issue comes up.